Hello, everyone. Um, in this screencast, I would like to uh, address this uh, very frequent question from students on how to calculate the irreducible representation of graphene when it comes to phonons. So here I'm going to provide you a full description of uh, how this goes. And uh, it seems a little bit convoluted, but it's actually very systematic. And uh, I hope you understand uh, what's going on by the end of the screencast. So we are going to focus on graphene. So graphene is this honeycomb lattice. Um, even though there's only carbon in this structure, uh, the unit cell is actually made up of two atoms. So two atoms that are needed to build the structure in a hexagonal lattice. And uh, for reasons that are going to be obvious uh, in this presentation, I have labeled them in two different colors, blue and red. Uh, because it's a lattice, it's a crystal, um, we only have to worry about the atoms that are in uh, the box there, the white box on the right hand side. And uh, we will, of course, use the fact that it's a crystal, it's, it's a two-dimensional system, uh, in the following. So what we, the questions we are going to answer in this screencast are the following. What are the symmetries? What's the point group? And most importantly, what are the irreducible representations when it comes to phonon? So I'm going to, the outline of this is the following. I'll talk first about the symmetries. I will determine the reducible representation. Starting from the reducible representation, I'll show you how you can calculate the irreducible representation. And I'll end up this screencast with the phonon symmetries. The first aspect to look at is are the symmetries of graphene. So uh, graphene actually has a lot of symmetries and the point group, so here I insist is the point group. So these are the group that keeps uh, atom uh, unchanged, that can leave some atom unchanged. The point group then is D6H, and D6H is made up of a number of symmetries, and I've represented them all on this slide. So let's, let me take a second uh, to explain each of them. Um, we are going to apply them uh, systematically in just a few minutes, so you should be able to understand them better. Well, like in every group, the, the first symmetry is the identity, it's called E. Uh, it's basically the symmetry that doesn't do anything. So that one does not need much more details. The second one is a six-fold axis that's represented by the green uh, hexagon on the second plot. And uh, in that one, uh, the axis is perpendicular to graphene and it rotates things by, uh, by 60 degrees. So we have two, uh, two such uh, C6 symmetry. We have one that goes clockwise and one that goes counterclockwise. So another way to say it is that you either have a 60 degree rotation or a minus 60 degree rotation, which is, can also be seen as a 30 de 300 degree rotation. So that's why we call it C6 to the power five because we, this is a 300 degree, uh, degrees rotation. The next uh, symmetry is a threefold axis, which is also uh, orthogonal to the plane. Uh, I represent it here uh, by a triangle, and it's basically a rotation of 120 degrees or and a rotation of 240 degrees. So C3 for 120 degrees, and C3 square for 240 degrees, which is equivalent to minus 120 degrees. Next, we have a two-fold axis still uh, in the center of the hexagon perpendicular to the plane. I represent here by a green dot, and it's a rotation of 180 degrees. Of course, there is only, only one such uh, rotation. Now comes two rotations, uh, two-fold rotation, which are rotations for axes that are in the plane of graphene. So the first one, the first set, uh, I represented them with the green axis here. Uh, they are called C2 prime, and there are three of them because, well, you have a hexagon and you can see them, the rotation very well there. Those, those axes uh, pass through um, bonds of the hexagons. Then we have a C2 prime prime. Uh, so we use prime prime, of course, to differentiate from the C2 and C2 prime. And those go uh, perpendicular to some 
bond of the uh, hexagons. So they are shown also very clearly on the picture. Now we can go to the next row. Uh, we have an inversion symmetry, which are represented by a black dot on the first, uh, on the first figure here on the second row. Uh, of course, inversion symmetry with respect to that point. Uh, before I move to S3 and S6, let me jump to sigma H. Sigma H is a plane which is uh, uh, a parallel plane that passes through the, the graphene structure. It's basically, it's, it's a mirror plane. So, uh, well, it's a mirror plane, of course, the atom are reflected on each other. Now let's go back to S3. S3 is actually an improper rotation. It's a rotation that's followed by a sigma H, if you will. So again, there is a rotation of, of 120 degrees followed by uh, this, uh, this reflection on the sigma H plane. So that's what's represented in uh, S3. There are two of them, 120 degrees and minus 120 degrees. That's why there is a two. Uh, similarly, there is, the, there is also a improper rotation of, of order six, which does the same uh, SS3, but in this case, the rotation is actually 100 and, two, and uh, uh, sorry, the rotation is 60 degrees and minus 60 degrees. And finally, we have two more, um, two more symmetries. Uh, the first one is sigma D, is also a reflection plane. Uh, I tried to represent it the best I could here with the green, um, the, the green plane uh, shown in perspective. And it's a plane that passes through uh, that, that cut uh, uh, bonds in uh, the structure. Uh, so you can see them uh, there. Uh, they go uh, through the, the they, they, they go through the center of, of bond. And sigma V is also a plane, a real plane, but in this case, the plane uh, intersect the graphene layer uh, through uh, carbon bonds. So, uh, if I went a bit too fast, you just pause and spend a couple of minutes uh, staring at these, uh, these symmetries that we are going to apply them in just a minute. Now, the next step, once you know the point group symmetry, D6H, uh, you go to the table, the character tables uh, that exist in many databases, and you can find them online very easily, and you get the character table here. So this character table, of course, is a little, uh, I mean, it's, it's full. It's a big table because you have lots of you have lots of symmetries. So on the first row, you have all the symmetries we just discussed on the top row, and and then you have a number of representation of these uh, of these symmetries. So the character table is basically the trace of the of the uh, transformation matrix for each of these or um, of these operations. So this is not a a screencast on group theory. It's a it's a screencast on the application of group theory. So I would imagine that you know this. Uh, the column linear function, quadratic and cubic, will come in very handy uh, later. They are also part of the tabulated character table for each group. Now, before now, it's time to move on to the irreducible representation. So before we go there, it's maybe a good idea to remind you some definitions. So let's uh, let's introduce two definitions which come in, uh, which are very important. Usually, representation are represented by the letter uh, gamma, the capital Greek letter gamma, uh, and so we have the first one, which is called the gamma n representation, and n stands for the number of atoms of your unit cell. Uh, so this is the symmetry of individual atom in the molecular crystal. So you will see, uh, we are going to spend some time building that and I think it's going to become clear. Now we can also endow uh, some axis, XYZ axis to each atom. And in that case, we have three uh, degrees of freedom per atom, basically. And in that case, we call it the gamma 3N representation because, well, there are three N degrees of freedom, three displacement per atom. And uh, they represent the symmetry of the possible atomic displacement in the three dimension. Now, uh, what, you are, what we are really interested in for our purpose for phonons is the gamma 3n. Uh, but gamma n is much easier to, to, to calculate, even though you could calculate gamma 3n directly. I will not do it here, but it's possible to do it. 
the trick is that there is a way to go from the gamma n uh, to the gamma 3n representation, again using the character table. And for that, we have to remember that in our case, we have a number of properties of translation of the crystal and those properties of the, transla uh, um, of the, of the translation will allow us to go from gamma n to gamma 3n. Let me uh, explain to you what it means. So uh, we need to be able to represent the three-dimensional space. So the representation of the three-dimensional space uh, comes from the fact that each diatom can move in x, y, and z direction. Now, uh, it turns out that this, this representation, again, uh, representation in the, in the context of group theory, uh, is called co gamma displacement, is simply the, the sum of the displacement of the representation in all three directions, x, y, and z. Now, this may look like very um, formal to you, but actually that information is directly uh, available in the character table. I'm going to explain that to you in a second. So we can find those irreducible representation of the displacement uh, for, for, for mechanisms that behave like the x, y, and z coordinate. So you can easily find those in the character table. So let's go back to the character table. This is a character table. And if you look at the column here on the linear function, you see you're going to find x, y, and z. And those x, y, and z for the function, are those rep correspond to the representation of those displacements in x, y, and z. In this case, uh, unsurprisingly, the x and y are degenerate. It's unsurprising because of the invariance in the plane of graphene. And uh, the z direction is, um, is separate. It's, it's perpendicular to the plane. So we see that in that case, the irreducible representation for those three uh, displacements are given in the table by A2u for gamma z and by E1u for gamma x and gamma y. Just as a reminder, we know it's a two-dimensional representation, the E1u, because we have a two in the first column. While A1u is a one-dimensional representation, there's a reason why there's only a one there, okay? So that's very, very simple. We can already calculate the re irreducible representation for the displacement in this system. Now, let's go to the, the actual, uh, to, to, to the next step. The gamma n, so the, rep the irreducible representation for uh, the symmetry of the atom, the unit cell, so we call them gamma n, as I reminded you a few minutes ago. So they describe the symmetry of the position of the n atom. Uh, this is actually pretty easy to do. Uh, these are essentially, this is going to be the sum, of course, this, this, uh, this reducible representation gamma n is going to be the sum of the irreducible representation. And we will see how it's done. So we obtain gamma n by examining the effect of each symmetry on the atomic positions. So if you're a little bit lost now, don't, don't just uh, log off uh, this uh, YouTube uh, presentation. I'm going to explain that in great details, how we obtain gamma n for graphene. But before I go there, I'm going to wrap up this by saying how we get gamma 3n, so the, the reducible representation of all the displacement of all the atoms in three direction, and are simply given by this direct product between the reducible representation of the atomic position with the, those uh, displacement in x, y, and z that I just described to you. So uh, this multiplication, this direct product, is actually, actually translated to a simple uh, product from the character table. Once again, I'm going to explain all that to you for graphene in just a minute, but I need to introduce this to you first. And finally, once we have the reducible representation, we can calculate the irreducible representation. And for that, we use the gamma 3 n I just explained, and we calculate the coefficient of, for each representation. Uh, once again, uh, I will explain this equation a little bit. I will apply that, that equation for the case of graphene in just a few minutes and you will understand exactly what it means. Uh, let, just me, let me just remind you that H here is the total number of operations, so it's 24 for D6H. N is the number of operations for each class. For example, remember we had two C6 uh, rotations, so the N would be, six, would be two uh, for the particular class uh, of C6. 
for example. Um, we, if we look, look at sigma h, for example, there is only one um, operation in that class, so n will be equal to one, just to give you an idea. Then at the end, we can even remove the pure uh, translation from that irreducible representation, uh, but we will get to that uh, in a minute. So I hope that so far so good, maybe a little formal, uh, but it will make sense now that we are going to apply it in detail to graphene. So as a reminder, the graphene, graphene is shown here. Uh, the unit cell is shown in the white losange and with the atom colored differently since they are not equivalent atoms. So we need both atoms essentially to build the crystal. That's what it means by non-equivalent. Well, we are going to go through all, we are going to calculate gamma n. And for that, what we need to do is simply um, look at what the, the, each operation does. So let's start with a simple one. The effect of the identity is, of course, to move the atom onto, onto themselves. And uh, the, the number, the character of this particular case is going to be the number of atoms that are unchanged. So, of course, for the E, there's going to be two. So I put a two here. All right. Now, let's move to another, uh, another one. C6. So the C6 rotation, uh, I'm, there is a little animation here. I hope you see it. I represented the image, so the, 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 the result of the symmetry by dotted circle in the, with the cor corresponding color. I hope you are going to see that. We are going to first move the red atom, which is in the losange. Uh, if we apply the C6, the red atom is going to move there. So you see that on top of the blue one. And the blue atom is going to move there on top of the red one. So how many atoms have remained unchanged? Zero. So we have no atoms have remained unchanged under the, those symmetries. Therefore, we enter a zero in that row. Now next, the C3 axis, we are moving the red atom to, the, to another red atom down here. And we are moving the blue atom to another blue atom. However, because it's a crystal, all the blue atoms are equivalent, all the red atoms are equivalent. So the number of atoms that were unchanged, because it's an infinite crystal, the number is two. So that's why we have a number two here for the class. So as a reminder here, we only have to apply one of the symmetry. Uh, you can say, well, it's two for C3 and three, uh, two for C3 square. So it should be four. No, it's two. It's for the class that we put here. The next one is C2. Uh, again, the C2, the red atom is going to be moved to this blue atom here. And the blue atom is going to move to the top of the red atom. So the number of atoms that remain unchanged is zero. This is why I colored the atom blue and red differently, because again, the red and blue atom are not equivalent from a crystal perspective. OK. Now we can keep going. We can do the C2 prime. Uh, C2 prime is the axis that's right there. Uh, and the blue atom, the, the first red atom is going to move, be moved to another red atom. And the blue atom is going to move the, to the other blue atom because it's rotated uh, with respect to this vertical axis. So the number two in my ta little table. can do the same for C2 prime prime. C2 prime prime, for one of the axes is this one. The red atom is moved to the blue atom, and the blue atom is removed to the red atom. So the number of atoms that moved, uh, I mean, they both moved, but the number of atoms that did not change is zero in this case. So we put a zero in the table. We keep going for the inversion. The, blue the red atom here is going to be moved to the blue atom here, like here, and the blue atom is going to move to the red atom. So the number of atoms that have changed, that have, that are, that are, invariant under this symmetry is zero. We put a zero in the table. We do the same for S3. S3 again, the blue atom uh, is going to move, uh, sorry, the red atom is going to move to this other red atom here. And this blue atom is going to be moved to this blue atom. So the number of atom that didn't move because we have to include the translation of the infinite crystal is two. Now we can do C6. For C6, the red atom is going to be moved to the blue atom, the blue atom to a red atom. The number of atoms that didn't move, didn't change, is zero. You can do that for sigma H. For sigma H, uh, the red atom is going to move on itself, the blue atom on itself. So the number of invariant 
an, an, of atom that, you know, that, uh, that are invariant is two. Sigma D, this is this one. I hope you see uh, where uh, the animation is going to go. We are first moving this red, this red atom here, and we are moving the blue atom there. So the number of atoms in a change on the sigma D is zero, hence the zero in this table. And finally, the last symmetry is this one, where the plane goes through the bond, or some bond of, the, of graphene. Uh, the red atom is going to move to another red atom, and the blue atom to another blue atom. Therefore, the number here is two. So you see, this is basically all the work you have to do to calculate uh, the, the reduce, reducible representation uh, gamma n. Okay, when, we say, when I say reducible representation, it means that it can be expressed as a direct sum of irreducible representation of the group. Now, we are, we've made a lot of progress. We have to do a little bit more. So let's go back to our, um, to our character table. Just same as before, okay? Um, first of all, we need to find those, uh, in order to go from gamma n to gamma 3n, remember, we have to find the displacement, the irreducible representation of the displacement. Well, we know the displacement actually given in the table, I already mentioned it. Along z will be this one, and along x and y will be this one. Therefore, the displacement, the irreducible uh, displacement, uh, irreducible representation for displacement, gamma x plus gamma y plus gamma z, is simply given by the sum. Actually, all you have to do is sum. 1 plus 2, 3. 1 plus 1, 2. 1 minus 1, 0, and so on and so forth. So you get those numbers directly like this. Um, I'm going to reproduce now the, the result we just obtained uh, by examining all the symmetries. It's gamma n. I just reproduced the table I showed we just built together. And finally, you can calculate gamma 3n using this formula, which translates in the character table by a simple product. So we are going to get gamma 3n here on the yellow line by 3 times 2, 6, 2 times 0, 6, and so on and so forth. So you can calculate all that, and you end up with your reducible representation gamma 3n by this product. So you know you've done things right when you look, for example, at E. E, if you, were, if you were giving three displacements, so three axes, X, Y, and Z on each atom, of course, under the identity, uh, none of them change, so we have a number six. Uh, you can actually calculate gamma three and directly if you want, uh, by looking at how the displacement X, Y, Z uh, move under the symmetry. It's very doable. Uh, there's just a little subtlety when you do, for example, a C3. Uh, or, oh, um, in fact, a, a, yes, a C3 or, or even a C2. So I'm not going to do that directly, but if you feel so inclined, you can calculate gamma 3 and directly, but it's much easier this way. Okay, excellent. Now we have a reducible representation. All we have to do is to calculate the irreducible representation. So by irreducible representation, we mean that this gamma 3n is a sum of reducible representation that's also given in the table. And there is a formula for that. The formula is given by, that I already showed you before, but it's here. The A is going to give you the number, if, if a particular representation, so one of, those, uh, along, one of those rows, I remove most of them but one, are part of the reducible representation or not. Or not. So the chi reducible actually uh, those that are those numbers that we have in the yellow line, and the chi i actually those that are given for a given representation. I already mentioned to you n is the number of operation in each class. So you see for this one, for example, for three c two prime prime there are three, for the inversion there is one, and so on and so forth. So you have to calculate this. I've done it in particular. I applied this for you to know how it's done. Uh, for example, for A1G, 1 over 24, H is equal to 24, and you do all this sum product. It is correct. I've checked it twice. Uh, if you want to do it, pause the YouTube video and check that everything is correct. You do all the sum and you find that this is equal actually to zero. What it means is that because it's zero, that means that A1G is not part 
of the irreducible representation of gamma 3n. Now you have to do that for all the representation in the table, and then you end up with the irreducible uh, representation. Now it looks like a daunting thing, a lot of, lot of stuff to do, but you know what? I actually have done it in an Excel sheet. It took about two minutes to write the, the formula in the Excel sheet. And this is actually a snapshot of the Excel sheet that I've done to obtain all those numbers. And uh, we, we, have, we have all that uh, in this following table. It's a lot of data, but don't be too scared because you already know the top half is the character table. The three lines there are what we worked with. And then the next one is just something that was calculated by the Excel sheet. Finding on the, on the rightmost column what, if that uh, representation, irreducible representation, was part of gamma n or not. Um, oh, sorry, gamma 3n. You can actually do it for gamma n as well, but I did it for gamma 3n here. And we see that there are four uh, irreducible representation here that are part of of the of the reducible representation that are given on by the yellow highlighted yellow, uh, so let me show it uh, in the next slide so that it's a bit bigger. Now we can see it here, um, the the four uh, irreducible representations that corresponds to the reducible representation of gamma three n, and uh, the fact that it's a composition of the four is actually shown by a direct sum. Uh, which we show with a plus sign along with a circle on it. Now we can go a little bit further than this and separate all those irreducible irreducible representations between what is our true vibrations versus what is what are translation. Uh, so the good news is that we can actually write again just using the same technique and it's the first line in the blue box that all the irreducible representation are direct sum between the vibrations and the translation. Now, what's nice about this, of course, is that we have already encountered the translation. The translation are the pure displacement along y, x, and z, so x, y, and z. And I wrote them as gamma translations. So the gamma translation are gamma x plus gamma y plus gamma z that we've seen before. And if you go a few slides before, you remember that these were represented by A2U and by A1U. So the remainder, E1G and B2G, are actually those true vibrations that we find in the structure at the gamma point, so at the center of the Brillouin zone. So we have all those modes, and uh, we can go, we can use the, the character table even a little bit more. Uh, by looking at which ones are Roman active. So let's go back to uh, the character table. So the character table is right here. And uh, we've seen that the four um, irreducible representation of the, of the 3n, uh, of the gamma 3n uh, uh, reducible representation are those four lines. In blue, I put the pure translation. And therefore, what's left are the vibrations, E1g and B2g. Now you can tell which one is Raman active by looking at the column of the function here, or the quadratic function, because we know that for a mode to be uh, Raman active in first order, we need uh, those modes to uh, transform like a quad quadratic function. And we see that only the E1G uh, is actually such a mode. Uh, so E1G is Raman active. In fact, it's the well-known G band that we found in graphene. Well, B2G is not Raman active. So the only mode that's active will be this one. And I'm going to conclude this screencast by showing you the band structure of phonons that, we, that I calculated using a machine learning potential, so the gap potential. And uh, we obtain this result here, and we see indeed there are six modes at the gamma point. For, of course, there are six degrees of freedom, three displacement uh, for each atom. Therefore, six modes. And uh, we can very easily find which ones are the different symmetries. So the E1U are translation along X and Y, which are degenerate, of course, because uh, graphene is isotropic. Therefore, the displacement uh, in X and Y are equivalent. And we can see them by the little cartoon I showed. And then we have the flexural mode, which is the displacement along Z, and it has the A2U uh, symmetry. Now for the uh, vibrational mode, the acoustic branches, so those that are not zero at gamma, 
we have uh, three modes, E1G and B2G. We can easily see that one is indeed W-degenerate, is the E1G, this is the G band, and Raman active. While the other one, the B2G, is actually not Raman active because uh, its displacement does not correspond to a change in the polarizability of the material. So I hope this screencast was useful to you and then I was able to show you how you can actually make a lot of sense of the symmetries from scratch, uh, just using uh, maybe your skills in, in seeing what symmetries do, as well as the use of the uh, character table that we can find from the different structure. Uh, if you have any question about uh, what I described here, please do not hesitate to put those questions uh, in comment in this YouTube channel. And thank you very much for your attention for those who stayed all the way to the last slide of this presentation. Thank you.